Okay, we're back here at theCUBE on this floor in Cloud City, the center of all the action at Mobile World Congress. I'm John Furrier, your host. Michael Curran, CTO of Vertisan, is here with me remote because this is a virtual event as well. This is a hybrid event. It's the first industry hybrid event. Great to be back in real life on the floor. Michael, you're coming in remotely. Thanks for joining us here in theCUBE in Cloud City. Thanks for having me, I'm excited to be here. We were just talking on camera about you went to Michigan and football, all that good time while we were hit, waiting from Adam from the studio, great stuff. But let's get into what you guys are doing. You got a great cloud news we're going to get to, but take a minute to explain what you guys do first. So Vertisant helps organizations of any size thrive in the cloud. So we have a unique combination of proprietary technologies such as our cloud optimization platform that we'll talk about in a minute and a global team of experts that helps companies make the most of the cloud from getting to the cloud and building the cloud to optimizing the cloud all the way to managing the cloud at scale. Well you got a lot of experience dealing with the enterprise, a lot of customer growth over the years, great leader. Um, the cloud dynamic here is a, the big story at Mobile World Congress this year, the changeover, I won't say changeover per se, but certainly the shift or growth of cloud on top of telco. You guys have some news here at Mobile World Congress. T let's share the news. What's the big scoop? So we have an automated cloud optimization platform that helps companies automatically understand usage patterns and reduce spend fully automatically. And we focus first on AWS as the biggest cloud provider. But um, starting this week, what we wanted to announce is we're actually going live with our GCP product, which means um, people who are on the GCP cloud platform can now leverage our platform to constantly understand usage patterns and spend and automatically take action to reduce spend. So we typically see customers save over 50% when they use our platform. So now uh, GCP customers can take advantage of the same capabilities that our AWS customers take advantage of every day. Talk about the relationships as you get deeper, and this seems to be the pattern. I want to just unpack, if you don't mind, a little bit the relationship with Google and this announcement and Amazon. You're tightly coupled with them. Is it more integration? Talk about what makes these deals different um, and special for, for your customers. What's, a, what's, a, what's about them? What's the big deal? Well, I think for us, obviously we think that, um, you know, the public cloud's the future, right? And obviously Cloud City and all, all the different companies there agree with us. And we think that, you know, much like, you know, you, you, don't, you don't generate your own electricity um, we don't think you're going gen to you're, you're gonna build your own technology infrastructure for the most part. We think that pretty much all compute will be in the public cloud. And obviously AWS is the market leader um, and the largest cloud provider in the world. But you know, GCP, especially with telecom, um, has some compelling offerings. And, and we think that you know, organizations are going to want choice. Um, Many will go multi-cloud, meaning they'll have one, two, three of the big providers and, and, and move workloads across those. But even those who choose one cloud provider, um, you know, each cloud provider has their strengths and different companies will choose different, different providers and they're all, you know, they've all got strong capabilities and their uniqueness. Um, so we want to make sure that whether, you know, an organization goes across all cloud providers or they choose one that we can support them no matter what their workloads look like. And so for us, you know, developing deep relationships with each of the public cloud providers, but also, you know, expanding our full set of capabilities to support all of them is critically important because we do think, yeah. um, we do think that there's, there's going to be, you know, a handful of large public cloud providers and obviously AWS and GCP are among them. Yeah, I mean, I talk to people all the time, and even, you know, we're an Amazon customer, pretty robust cloud, and the bill's out of control. Is what's, what's this charge for? There's more services to tap into, you know, it's like, first one's on me, you know, and, and then next thing you know, you're, you're consuming a hell of a lot of new services, but there's value there, and it's, that's the benefit of the cloud, we all love that. Uh, but uh, so as a random aside here, I want to get your thoughts real quick, if you don't mind. Um, this idea of a cloud economist has become part of a new role in organizations, certainly SREs, is DevOps, then you're starting to get into people who actually can squint through the data and understand the consumption and be more on the economics side because people are changing how they report their earnings, they're changing how they report their KPIs based upon the usage and costs. And what, is this real? What's your thoughts on that? I know it's a little random, but I want to get your, get your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, it's interesting that that's been a development. What, what I will say is, um, you know, the, the, the economics are cl of cloud are complicated. 
and they're still changing and still emerging. So I think that, I think that's probably more of a reaction to how dynamic the environment is than kind of a long-term trend. I mean, admittedly for us, you know, we, we hope that, you know, a lot of those, 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 the, that analysis and the data that's required um, will be provided by our platform. So you can think about it as, um, you know, a, a digital or AI powered cloud economist. So I don't, I don't know, hopefully our customers uh, can use the platform and get everything they need and they, they, they won't need to go out and hire a, a cloud okay. economist. It sounds expensive. Well, I think one of the things that sounds like a great opportunity is to make that go away where you don't have to waste the resource to go through, that, through the cost side. I want to get your thoughts on this. This comes up all the time, certainly on Twitter. I'm always riffing on it. It comes up on a lot of my interviews and private chats with people about their, their, their cloud architecture. Spend can get out of control pretty quickly and data is a big part of it. Moving data is always going to be cost, especially Amazon and, and Google. Moving data in and out of the cloud is great. Now with the edge, I just talked to Bill Vass at uh, Amazon Web Services, he's the VP of engineering. You can literally bring the cloud to the edge, and all the clouds are going to be doing this, these edge hubs. So that's going to process data at the edge, but it's also going to open up more <laughs> services, right? So, you know, yep. it's complicated enough as it is. Spend is getting out of control, and it only seems to be getting out of control even more. How do you talk to yeah, customers I mean, that want to not be afraid, they want to jump in, but they also want to have a hedge? Yeah. What, what's your what's your take? You know, your I think that. Sure. You know, I think there, there's a lot of debate right now as to whether or not you know moving to the cloud, from a cost perspective, is is cost effective, um, or more costly. And, and there's a pretty healthy debate going on at the moment. I think that the reality is, um, you know, yes, you know, the cloud makes it easier for you to <clears throat> take on new services and bring on new things, and that of course drives drive spend, but it also unlocks incredible possibilities. And you know, what we try to do is help organizations take advantage of those possibilities and, and, and kind of the, the capabilities of the cloud while managing spend. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a complex problem, but it's a solvable problem. So for us, we think that you know, the, the, the job of the cloud providers is to you know, continue to innovate and continue to bring more and more capability to bear so that organizations can transform through technology. Um, the job of the teams using that technology is to really leverage those capabilities to build and to innovate and to serve their customers. And what we want to do is enable them you know, to, to do that in a cost-effective manner. And we believe, and we have data to prove that you know, if, if you do public cloud right, it's cheaper. Um, because you know, those, those organizations you know, much like, you know, at the turn of the Industrial Revolution, factories used to have their own power plants because you couldn't effectively, reliably, and kind of cost effectively generate power at scale. Obviously, no one does that now. And I think with the cloud providers, it's the same thing. I mean, they're investing in proprietary hardware, tons of software, tons of automation. Uh, they're highly secure. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to always be able to, you know, provide a, a given capability at a lower cost point. Like, of course they need to make profit. So there's a bit of margin in there, but you know, at the end of the day, we think that both the flexibility and capability of it combined with their ability to operate at scale gives you a, a better value proposition, especially if you do it right. And that's what we want to focus on is, you know, the answer's there. You just need the right data and the right intelligence to find it. And yeah, I totally, I totally agree with you. In fact, I had a big there. debate with Martin Casada at Andreessen Horowitz about cloud repatriation, and he was calling this paradox. Yeah. Do you focus on the cost or the revenue? And obviously they have Dropbox, which is a big example of they did that. But, and I, I even interviewed the Zynga guys, and they, they, they actually went back to Amazon, although um, they didn't report that. But I'm a big believer that if you can't get the new revenue, then you're in cost mode, then and there are other issues. But again, I don't want to go there right now. <laughs> I can talk about that another time. But I want to get your, I want to get the playbook. So first of all, I love what you do. I think it's an opportunity to get, take that heavy lifting away from customers around understanding cost optimization. A lot of people don't know how to do it. So take us through a playbook. Uh, what are some um, best practices that you guys have seen to help people figure this out? What do you, what, what's the, what do you say to someone? Hey, help me, Michael, I'm in, I'm in a world of hurt. What do I do? What's the playbook? Can you give some examples, yeah. day in the life? Sure, so I think, <clears throat> I think the first thing is know what you're spending money on, which sounds obvious, but um, you know, there's 
cloud environments are complicated, especially at scale. There's hundreds of thousands of SKUs and lots of different usage patterns. And I think the first thing is understand what you're spending money on. Um, number two is understand what you're getting for that spend. Um, so, you know, what, do you, what, what value are you driving with that spend? Um, and then number three is put the information in the hands of the people who can do something about it. And I think that is, is one of the things that we really focus on is, you know, we built our product from an engineering focus first. It was engineers solving the problem of understanding how to keep cloud costs in control. And so our whole principle is give the people working with the technology the data <clears throat> to make good decisions and give them the power to act to act on it. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of companies say, oh, we're spending more over here, or maybe we should look at that. Um, but but what we believe is actually be specific. Where are you spending money? Where exactly are you spending too much and what should you do about that? And give that information to the people who can take action, which are the engineers. And then lastly, um, make it important in the organization because there's a ton of competing priorities. And you know, what we found is that you know, where there's leadership support, um, there's results. And so I think if you do the, those four things, um, you know, results will follow. Now, obviously, you know, you need to understand specific utilization yeah. patterns and know what to do with different kinds of resources and all of that stuff is complicated. Um, but there are certainly solutions out there, ours included, who, who help you with that. So if you, if you, if you get the other four things right, plus you have some help, um, you, you can keep it under control and, and actually not just keep it under control, but, but operate in an environment that's, you know, much cheaper than hosting all this technology yeah. yourself. I mean, and that, much more flexible. That's a great point. I mean, the fact that you mentioned earlier, the engineering piece, that is so true. People I talk to, you know, our experiences and it's pretty common, the DevOps team tends to get involved in things like making sure you're buying reserve instances or all kinds of uh, ways to optimize patterns. And that's also an issue, right? I mean, first of all, it makes sense that they're doing it, but they're also the engineering time is being spent on essentially accounting at that point, demonstrates right. the shift. I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying that it's got to be realistic. It's a time sink for the engineering when they're not engineering accounting, or should they? This is a legit question. It's not so much they should or shouldn't. I mean, if you said to someone, hey, you're paid to build and write software and you're spending your time you know, solving accounting problems, that's obviously a mismatch. But when you're talking about SREs and DevOps, Michael, it's kind of what might not be a bad thing. Just right, I mean, so how do people react to that? Are they kind of scratching their head in the same way or, or um, are you guys the solution to that? Well, I, th I think that at first they are, but, but for us, at least, it's, you know, we don't want them trying to understand the intricacies of a savings plan or understanding kind of the different options for, you know, compute instances. What we want them to do is we give them all the information. So our approach is give them all the information they need to quickly make a decision. Let them make a decision, like push a button, and then let the change happen automatically. Yeah. So, so if you think about it, you know, the, the amount of time they spend is, is you know, a minute. And yeah. that's the goal because then we can use their expertise so it's not a finance person or an accountant doing research and making decisions that may or may not make technical sense and then looping in a bunch of people and they all talk and then yeah. you know, all that, that kind of whole process. It's, you know, here is you know, a data-driven observation and recommendation. Yeah. You have context, say yes or no. If you push the button and you say yes, then you know, the change happens. If you yeah. say no, the system learns and it's, it's and, building and it's right into the pipelining there it's like shifting left of security yep. it's the same concept it's really a, a great thing i really think you're onto something big i love this story it's kind of one of those things where reality's there uh michael we got 30 seconds left i want to get your thoughts to share um what put a plug in for the company what you guys are doing uh what are you looking to hire give it you got a 30 second plug go plug the company what do you got up well you know we we think that um you know, for any organization, big or small, um, trying to make the most of the public cloud and be cloud first, um, you know, we, we bring a unique set of expertise, automation, and technology capabilities to bear to help them thrive in the cloud and make the most of it. So, you know, obviously, we would love to work with any company um, that, that wants to be cloud first and, and fully embrace the public cloud. And I think we've got all the tools 
to, to, to help them thrive. Yeah, and Ben, I think, I think the, the, the confluence of business logic, technology engineering, working together, it's a home run. It's only going to get more stronger. So congratulations. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Okay. Thank you. Adam, back to you in the studio for more action. The Cube is out. We'll see you later. <laughs>